sermon, okay? But it's a good thing as well. It's a very good thing as well. Remember that. But before the sermon, we are going to listen. I think it's his uh, We are going to listen to the scripture reading, okay? So let us pay attention. Peace and love with others. Amen. Okay, so 
I did traditional service this morning. It was so nice and proper and everybody's looking nice and I've got the robe on and I'm almost sweating. I forgot how hot robes are. Um, I don't have it now, y'all look relaxed. So hopefully, hopefully, if you have anything you want to say during the sermon, don't be afraid to say it. I like to be interactive and know you haven't fallen asleep on me. When I was in elementary school, which wasn't that long ago, my, one of my best, 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 bestest friends was black. Her name is Janita, and her mother was my second grade teacher. Most kids refer to their teacher as Mr. or Miss in the last name. I didn't use that for her. My second grade teacher was Mama Relaford to me. She was my other mother. And Janita was kind of like my sister. Her friends couldn't understand why she wanted to be friends with a white girl. My friends couldn't really understand why one of my best friends was a black girl. We had no explanation. All we knew was that we enjoyed being around each other. So, occasionally, the school she went to was on a six-week system. My school was on a nine-week system. So our breaks were different sometimes. If she was on break and I wasn't, she'd come spend the weekend with me. We'd hang out. When I was on break and she wasn't, I'd go, to, I'd go to spend the weekend with her. And there were a couple of times I even went to school with her. You can't do that now. We had so much fun. She would introduce me to her friends as her, her twin sister. And they would look at us funny. And she'd go, oh, she came out first. I stayed in and got done a little longer. <laughs> watching everybody's expressions. But that's really how we felt about each other. One of the weekends I stayed with her. She and her mom were going to go to church on Sunday night. Kind of the, uh, their version of the traditional. You know, they had the, the hat Sunday morning services. And the Sunday evening, they came comfortable and they went to church. Well, on this Sunday night, I go with Janita. And the kids are singing. Here I'm a visitor, and I'm going to have to sing? Oh my gosh. So we do a little practice run before church service. And we're singing when the saints go marching in. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a black church when they sing when the saints go marching in, but they will bring the walls down. So the kids had some expectations they were going to have to meet. So the pressure was on. So not only was I visiting and suddenly singing in front of a bunch of people I didn't know, I was going to have to sing it and keep up with everybody else. Well, before the service, we're practicing. And in walked Janita and me. And all the friends say, hey, Janita, hey, Janita. And then they'd look at me. And then they'd look at her. So we all sit down and we get ready to practice. And everybody starts kind of doing this number like, oh, God, I hope she doesn't sit by me. <laughs> we practice. We get to church. And it's time for us to sing. We start singing. People in the congregation clapping their hands. They're swaying. They're smiling. They're loving it. And I thought, you know, this is kind of fun. But that brief moment, skin color didn't matter. It didn't matter that I wasn't a member of the church. It didn't matter that I didn't live in that city. And it didn't matter that I was white. We were all praising God together. It was a beautiful thing. After the church service, the kids come back to the choir room and we're all kind of like, oh, we were so nervous, but we're glad it's over now. Girl comes up to Janita. She kind of nods her head in my direction. And she goes, I suppose she's kind of cool for a white girl. Now, normally people might have gotten offended, like, what do you mean by like a white girl? I found it such a, a, an honor, really, that she thought I was kind of cool. Because that was her way of saying, I was part of their group. I was one of them. And I had become a neighbor.
the lawyer. In Luke 10, verse 25, asks Jesus, so who's our neighbor? He was trying to trick Jesus. He should have known. Jesus never answered questions directly. He always answered them with another question. So the lawyer wasn't that smart to do that. <clears throat> now it was funny because Jesus was not known for following the rules either, especially the Jewish customs. He was a little bit of a radical. And back then, the challenge of being neighborly was critical in Judaism because the Israelites were so self-conscious because they were the chosen people. They felt like they were moving targets. They'd go somewhere, and, oh, I hope not, but mm. And they tended to cluster together. But they clustered together because nobody else really knew, other than the other Israelites, what they were going through. But it got to a point that they were clustered together so tightly that they were ignoring everybody else around them. Even to the point they were starting to judge and criticize those who weren't Israelites. Moses comes along and says, you know what? Even if you're not a Jew, come on to Passover. Passover is very sacred. I guess that is me. For the Jewish tradition. And so for Moses, Testament. 
And in the Old Testament, the Israelites are charged with special, this is a big word, injunctions. That's a serious word. It's not just a suggestion to do something. It's mandatory. They had certain laws for how to treat each other. It had gotten that bad. It was taking laws to tell grown-ups how to act, how to be nice. The reason these injunctions were put into place was because the Jews were clinging to each other. But you can't really fault them. Because they were bonded together. They had a history together. And now even in Christianity, it's the same way. We are, as Christians, show a similar type of prejudiced love. It's easy to love other Christians, well, as a whole. Sometimes individually we might get on each other's nerves. But as a whole, it's easy to love each other when we have the same beliefs. So the problem lies. And when we take that prejudiced love of those like us and ignore or condemn those who aren't instead of learning from them. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35 lays a solid foundation for what it means to be neighborly. And it says, Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many that owned lands and property sold what they had and gave the proceeds to the community. They laid those proceeds at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to everybody. In the 10th chapter of John, Jesus takes the concept of neighbor, and in his typical style, stretches boundaries to include dare I say it non-Jews all this time Jews had considered their neighbors as being other Jews and here comes Jesus going eh, not so fast and he says a neighbor is it anyone that you come in contact with anyone whether you're a Jew Samaritan or a Gentile. So now we can get a little better understanding of the story of the Good Samaritan. Because it addresses the issue of stretching those boundaries. How much do we limit ourselves with generosity and compassion? <clears throat> As Christians, we are to love our neighbors. Everyone we come in contact with. Not just fellow Christians. And as you can imagine, the very fact Jesus tells the teachers of the law that the Samaritan was the good guy. Samaritans were lower than low lower than the potholes you see in the streets here. I mean, they were low. And Jesus uses a Samaritan to be the good guy. Not only did he dare use the Samaritan as the good guy, but then he tells the lawyer, go and do the same. He told that lawyer, the teacher of the Jewish law, go and be like a Samaritan. The lawyer didn't go and do the same. He would be beneath the Samaritan. This parable teaches us several lessons, but the two most important ones are that we are to show love for anyone and everyone. 
period. We're all children of God. The second is that we are to love our enemies, those not like us, as ourselves. Matthew 5, verse 46 says, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? And if you greet your brethren only, what are you doing that's so special? Sometimes we get caught up in being Christians and we forget to actually care about each other. James 1, verse 27 tells us that the whole essence of religion is to care for the widows and the orphans, those in need, and to resist the temptations of the world, some of which are judgment and gossip. Mm. During communion, a couple Sundays ago, when I was at Broadmoor, we, we have a very aged congregation. So the folks that are there, it's taking great effort physically for them to get there. And when it came time for communion, I saw the other the people in the pew sitting next to the ones who had difficulty getting up and walking. And without hesitation, turning around and extending their hand to help them up. And letting them hold on while they walked up the aisle to get communion. They were reaching out to make sure that their neighbor received the body and blood of Christ. Shouldn't we be that way every day? Not just in church. Jesus wants us to extend our right hand of Christian fellowship to anyone and everyone so that they receive his grace and love. Because it does no good to have grace and love and not share it. And who knows, one of these days, we may very well find ourselves in situations where we have to rely on a good neighbor. Amen.